welcome to Resource PNG. This week, we take a look at a recent workshop that was facilitated by the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. The resource industry is one that has contributed immensely to the development of Papua New Guinea. Mining, petroleum, and in recent times, energy have been at the forefront in bringing about much needed development, particularly in rural areas. In most project areas, developers take the lead in bringing about much needed health, education, and infrastructure development. The contribution of this sector to Papua New Guinea's economy was highlighted during a recent workshop facilitated by the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. presented on the important role that this sector continues to play, in particular, the contribution of the mineral sector. Because the, the, the um, success and contribution of the small-scale living mining sector in Papua New Guinea is widely, I believe, widely unrecognised. It's difficult to estimate figures, but uh, we, we consider about 60 to 80,000 people probably <coughs> involved in as individuals and families in the living and mining sector right across the country. That's some of them are part-time, some of them are full-time. And uh, this, is, this is a very, very significant number, and it's almost every, every province in Papua New Guinea is blessed with alluvial gold in some parts. Some, some like uh, Morabi province in, in the southern part of Morabi province are very extensive alluvial fields. So, it's been estimated, and the Mineral Resources Authority now has some more definite figures, but we've estimated for a long time there's about four tonnes of alluvial gold produced across the nation every year. And that's sort of 120,000 ounces of gold. You're talking around probably 500, 600 million kina a year. And that's earned in foreign currency because the gold is sold overseas, effectively. So it's been, it's money coming into the country in foreign exchange. And it's been spread right across the country in the grassroots sector. So this is a, a, a fantastic contribution to the rural, uh, rural sector. And effectively every small-scale miner, you could say, is a, is a, is a small industry in, 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 in themselves. So when you talk about the growth of small to medium enterprises, the movie of miner is, in, in a sense, a, an enterprise on its own. So it, it's, it's, a great, it's a great sector for PNG. And, uh, MRA's recognised this and tried to foster it and grow it. We have now have a very successful small-scale mining training centre that they run in, in the Wau area. We've, su we've supported it uh, and, and that's uh, recognition of the importance of that centre. From 2002 to 2012, PNG benefited from record high commodity prices and its internationally competitive tax regime. This saw the country benefit from two new major mining project developments. However, since 2012, the sector has struggled significantly due to the following reasons. Falling commodity prices and increasing costs, and falling investor confidence due to policy uncertainty. It's important to realise that uh, commodity price drop in, in minerals happened about three years ago and uh, we've been uh, experiencing these lower, lower copper, gold, silver prices, etc., for now about three years. So that's had a, a pretty dramatic effect on our total mineral industry. On the one hand, you, you have the explorers, and we had a very strong and, and varied exploration sector, and that's now been dramatically affected, particularly the junior companies who don't have production, they're just involved in exploration they're unable to raise finance on the markets because exploration is not uh, the flavour of the month anymore. So they've been unable to raise finance and uh, many of them have literally run out of funds and they've had to curtail or, or uh, the companies have folded. On the production side, of course, it's had a dramatic effect because the value of the 
products that we produce has gone down, so the total value of our exports has decreased, the tax revenues has decreased, and, and in response to the um, fall in commodity prices, the, the projects have had to make a lot of effort to tighten up on costs and trim, trim their cost and improve productivity. On the oil and gas side, as you're aware, the oil prices fell last year, so there's been a catch-up in the oil sector. They're now experiencing the same situation, and uh, th there's already been a response by the by producers to trim to do through the same path to trim costs and look at their their overheads and so on. Similarly, with the smaller junior explorers, they will also be impacted uh, as time goes by, and and the, the, most of the forecasts are that the oil price will probably not rise significantly for quite some time. So there will, the, the oil and gas sector will follow the same type of path, and, and um, we have to we have to uh, be prepared to to weather the storm, so to speak, and to come out of it when commodity prices uh, rise in the best possible condition, so that we can capture the, the go forward. You're watching Resource PNG. We'll be back with more right after these messages. Welcome back to Resource PNG. We continue our look at the recent workshop facilitated by the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. During a recent workshop on resource projects in Papua New Guinea, Participants were given an insight into landowner businesses and their contribution to PNG development. Resource projects bring with them many opportunities. For people within a project's immediate vicinity, access to improved health, education, and infrastructure in most cases is significantly improved. There is also an opportunity for spin off benefits, including business. In recent times, many landowner companies have seen positive growth expanding their operations farther away from project sites. There are even some that have ventured into overseas markets. The Papua New Guinea Chamber of Mines and Petroleum had recently carried out a study into resource landowner companies. The chamber commissioned Richard Jackson, an international consultant in social and community affairs associated with resource projects in developing countries, to provide an analysis of landowner businesses at PNG resource projects. This study focused on the magnitude, scope, and contribution of the resource project landowner companies or LANCOs and businesses, as well as an assessment of issues and challenges common to these operations with recommendations for possible improvement. Uh, we're, we're aware in the Chamber that there was a lack, of, a lack of awareness in government about the extent of landowner business development right across the industry. And also, a lot of our, ourselves in the industry were not really aware of the extent of what was going on out there in the projects. So we decided we would commission a study to see if we could get a better feel, a better handle, a better scope of what was going on out there at all our projects. So the study was actually called Developing the Current State of Landowner Businesses Associated with Resource Projects in Papua New Guinea. And, uh, this, this thing is now, this report I'm pleased to say is now at the printers and will be on our website very shortly. We were, it is an integral part of the planning and strategy required, an approvals process required for, for any project and it has been for many years. And in, in the case of oil and gas, they, they refer to national content plans and, and the uh, ExxonMobil did a very detailed one for the LNG. LNG pro, pro, uh, project, and in, in, in their case, they also established the Business Enterprise Centre in Port Moresby to, to provide uh, training and planning assistance for landowner companies. Tim Amundsen, a consultant and long time employee within the resource industry in Papua New Guinea, was also present during the workshop and gave his thoughts on developments within this sector in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea has taken up an interest in all the large mining projects in Papua New Guinea, starting from Panguna and working right through to the latest one, which is Ramu. And I think it's important that Papua New Guinea does take an interest in these larger projects in equity, because the people don't have the opportunity to take it as individuals. 
and I think it's important that Papua New Guinea does own something of these major developments. So yes, I think it's a good thing. The setting up of Kumo, I think, is also a good thing because it's going to bring all that equity into one body, and that means that it will have professional people managing it for the government, all as one entity. So that means that all the equity of Octedi and um, the other equity that they own in projects, such as Ramu, will all be together um, in, one, in one body, and I think that's good. The industry has changed since the time that I've been here. I think in the early projects in Bougainville and Octedi and Misima, the people, the landowners, really were not involved and the provincial governments were really not involved. It was a deal between the developer and the national government. Pogra changed all that and it didn't change it because the government wanted it to change or the developer wanted it to change. It changed because the Pograns, who owned the land where the development was going to happen, wanted to be involved in the development and if they weren't, it would never have happened. So that was the start of the development forum process where everyone sat down around the table and the responsibilities and the benefits for that project were worked out and were then set out in an MOA. And that was the first project, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world where landowners and provincial governments ended up with equity in a project. And we really started that consultation process which is done widely around the world. And it's not recognised, but it actually started here in Papua New Guinea. I think what we have to ensure is that Papua New Guinea has laws which encourage investment and that it's also stable. And at the moment, we're facing low commodity prices, which makes it very difficult for exploration to take place and also for development to take place. So we need to help the explorers and the developers so that they can continue and that we can continue to get the benefits from these large projects. After the break, we take a look at the launch of the Papua New Guinea Investment Promotion Authority's strategic plan. Welcome back. The Papua New Guinea Investment Promotion Authority has undergone some significant changes in recent years. And this continued recently with the launch of IPA's Strategic Plan 2015 to 2017. In recent times, the Papua New Guinea Investment Promotion Authority has been on a drive to improve systems to enable more business activity within the country. This has seen IPA embark on several innovative projects which have made it easier for businesses to register to trade. Recently, it achieved another milestone with the launch of the IPA Strategic Plan. This strategic plan focuses on the challenges of the present operating environment and formulates a set of strategies which will lift the operations of the authority to the next level. Uh, the strategy, one of the things we did was to look at the operating environment and uh, obviously coming right out of the, of the construction phase or at the end of the cons construction phase of the LNG project, for instance, that 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 uh, allows us to look at what else is there, and uh, it it then uh, um, uh, required us to look at the emerging opportunities. And one of the things we we stated in that plan was uh, that uh, the development sector would, would would present itself as as a key uh, area for investors to look at. For instance, in the construction sector. Uh, the transport, particularly roads, bridges, the airports, uh, uh, noting particularly uh, a bit of capacity issue uh, uh, domestically. We've gone out and promoted uh, the fact that uh, the government's put in quite a bit of money in that sector and therefore opportunities for gaining contracts are abound. Um, in the uh, education and health, for instance, in the services sector, we've uh, looked at those areas where uh, the uh, obviously the uh, the LNG project has uh, has uh, encouraged uh, and also looked at the the areas where the government is investing heavily and and we said to ourselves look 
those areas uh, or what the planners say the enabling uh, the enablers um, uh, where we need to focus on and try to encourage uh, interest going into so that that's been uh, one of the issues one uh, the other one is uh, to, to to again look at uh, those investors who are already here so uh, to talk to them and look at what are the areas that that be interested in, and uh, that uh, that's called our after aftercare program, where we are um, commencing uh, discussions with investors who or have had experience with doing business in Papua New Guinea, and saying, okay, you've done this now. What else are you interested in? Are there opportunities that we could point you to? And uh, uh, it's still early days, but we think that we could generate quite a bit of interest to those who are already here, and uh, you know the. I guess the upside of it is that they, they don't have to uh, answer the questions uh, themselves about whether it's okay to come and invest in Papua New They're already here, so we, we try to encourage them to look in, in other areas. IPA has also been recognized for its efforts, with the authority taking out the 2015 Public Service Employer of the Year Award from PNG Human Resource Institute. Well, well, firstly, we, uh, we obviously, it's nice to be acknowledged once in a while, but I think uh, what it does is it, 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 it allows us to acknowledge that people have a perspective about what we do and um, it, it just so happens that the, the Human Resource Institute for, for PNG, that's uh, the institute representing something like 8,000 members, uh, they have formed the view that we are... Uh, we have done enough for 2014, so uh, obviously very happy with that. Uh, um, I think personally there's always room for improvement. I know uh, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done yet in terms of our registries. For instance, we rolled out a online lodgement um, registry uh, in uh, November 2013, we have had a full year of implementation. There's a lot of uh, teething issues on the technology front that we need to address yet. Uh, for some reason, the, the enabling legislations that uh, uh, runs the registry uh, took a bit of time with, with passage uh, and, uh, and the different legislative processes that uh, uh, was uh, required to happen before the laws are ready to be implemented. We are waiting, for instance, for the enabling regulations to be uh, to be um, processed through the uh, through the NEC. I think it's it's gone past the NEC, but needs to go uh, to the government house for gazettal before we could implement uh, parts of the law uh, that changed during the the legal reviews, as well as uh, charge some uh, uh, reviewed fees. So um, yeah, quite a few things to be done yet. And that's all we have time for on this edition of Resource PNG. If you'd like to contribute to the program, please email us. Our address, resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. You can also find us on Facebook. I'm Mary Batulo. This has been Resource PNG. 